everybody. This is the ESOP Guy, and we are on a journey to an ESOP and beyond. So excited today for this podcast because we're going to go into what does it look like for an ESOP trustee and what's their role and how does it all work. And to do that, we're going to interview Bryce Lennox. And Bryce has been a, a trustee that I've worked with on other deals. And so with that, Bryce, I just wanted to invite you and welcome you to our podcast. Well, thanks for having me, Phil. I appreciate it. Cool. So let me ask you, um, as you start off, as you start off introducing like your role and everything else, how did you get into ESOPs originally? By accident. Um, I think maybe like a lot of people, it, my, my journey is kind of interesting. I, I uh, am a lawyer. I became a lawyer in 1998. Uh, and, but frankly, I, I was a litigator and which is a little bit unique for the, you don't see a lot of litigators in the ESOP space, at least in the transactional side. I was a corporate litigator for a very large law firm here in Cincinnati where I live. I did all kinds of uh, litigation of, of multiple stripes. I did uh, because uh, I'm, I had an accounting background and I was a, a former accountant. I did a lot of litigation that involved financial malfeasance or uh, you know, business breakups sometimes uh, or business divorces where there were numbers involved and people were trying to figure out you know, shares and things along those lines. And so as a result of that, you know, I, I kind of, you know, I, I had a, I, I kind of am naturally a little bit risk averse as, as most litigators are and uh, kind of uh, maybe a little bit pessimistic as many litigators are. Um, but frankly, the way I entered, entered into the ESOP world is, uh, like I said, by accident, a, a colleague and a friend of mine, my college roommate, actually had an ESOP uh, out of Columbus, Ohio, that uh, they transitioned to ESOP in 2017. And his trustee resigned and retired, frankly, and uh, spoke with his lawyer and, and they said, well, we need a we need a new trustee. And they really weren't interested in a institutional trustee or a trust company. They wanted to work with an individual, an individual trustee like they had in the past. And uh, my college roommate knew kind of my background, knew my chops, if you will, and and asked me if I'd be his trustee. And I, I gladly accepted, you know, I, I, I it was kind of new to the space. So I, I, as many people do, I kind of drank through a fire hose and, and really kind of, you know, immersed myself in the in the ESOP world. I, uh, as you know, many people may or may not know, it's governed by the Department of Labor. And so the Department of Labor has put out, you know, multiple uh, what are called process agreements that kind of tell trustees like me how to how to put a deal together. And so I, I immersed myself in those and, you know, uh, and you know, several years later, you know, or many years later, here I am uh, as an ESOP trustee. Um, at that time, I really started with three and it's, it's grown uh, organically since then. And, you know, as you said, you and I have had the, I've had the privilege of working with you and your firm on several uh, ESOP transactions and, and I love it. And uh, I am, I'm no longer practicing law. I, um, a hundred percent, I've dove in feet first into the ESOP industry and, and frankly, I love it. Uh, awesome. I love working with entrepreneurs. Uh, it's just, it's a great place to be. And I think it's, uh, you know, I see myself in no other industry at this point. Awesome. Well, well, that's a really good, um, intro. And, and before we jump in too deep, I wanted to ask you in our tradition would be what, what's your favorite movie and why? Okay. Uh, I, I've always loved, uh, Quentin Tarantino. He is, I think he's, uh, you know, <laughs> and, 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 and I don't think what that says about me. Well, I know I'm going to say, oh my gosh. Me. Okay. Now, now what's your favorite Quentin Tarantino movie? That would be Pulp Fiction. Oh my gosh. For any reasons. Yeah. yeah for so. a lot of reasons. It's, it's a definitely a dynamic, um, you know, situation. So, um, cool. Well, great. Well, thank you for coming on the podcast today. And, and, um, I think it's interesting the first part of how you explained getting into this and I think one of the things about trustees too, they're, they're all from different walks of life. And, and it's not like any, when somebody says, Hey, I'm going to go to get my degree in being an ESOP trustee. It doesn't happen. Um, being an attorney and being a trustee, do you feel like what, what are the pros and cons of having that as your background as, as your discipline? Sure. I, I think, you know, particularly as a lawyer, you know, the, the practice of law, as you can imagine, there are, a lot of lawyers, I mean, lawyers are integral into the ESOP process in any number of, of ways, you know, in, in any deal, I as a trustee, you know, hire, uh, retain a valuation company to help me, you know, a financial advisor to help me with the numbers surrounding any proposed transaction. And I, you know, even though I am a lawyer, uh, you know, a lot of times or, you know, depending on kind of the size of the transaction, I almost, I, I retain outside counsel. 
uh, for any number of reasons, uh, because I, I think it, you know, it helps you really, you know, papering the deal. You know, it's always great to have another set of eyes on, on a transaction. You know, I think lawyers bring, you know, to the, to the ESOP world and maybe to the trustee side is I think I see some things, you know, maybe uh, like I noted, uh, I think ESOP or uh, litigators, litigators in particular are a little bit jaded. And so I think I look at I come with a little more, you know, an eye for, you know, more risk, maybe. Or, you know, I kind of I, I think I kind of look at it from a different lens as to where could be the problems with the transaction? Where could be the pitfalls? Mm-hmm. Where would if I were going to pick a deal apart, if I were the Department of Labor, where would I look? Mm-hmm. And what are the things, you know, that, you know, the trigger points, the red flags? And so I think when I approach a deal, I think I look at it through a, that lens, particularly uh, that maybe others, maybe they do. I'm sure a lot of people do, but I think lawyers are, you know, largely trained for that. And so I think it does help uh, in at least me as a trustee. I, I, I find it invaluable. Mm-hmm. No, I think that's, I mean, obviously having a, a discipline and being able to read documents and be able to understand risk and, and interpret that, especially within, within the ERISA guidelines and things like, as you mentioned, Department of Labor. Um, when you chose to be a trustee, did people kind of come at you and say, what are you doing? That's crazy. Cause you know, as a trustee, you do have a, a high degree of fiduciary financial responsibility. And so mm-hmm. talk about that a little bit. I mean, obviously it, um, they didn't scare you enough to say, I'm not going to do this. Right. Um, no, you know, but I did, you know, there were several raised eyebrows. I, I would be lying if I didn't say otherwise. Uh, because you're you're right. When when I am the trustee, I'm not you know as an individual trustee, I'm not a trust company. I don't get to sign it as you know as a corporation. I have to sign it individually. That means I am individually on the hook if the Department of Labor you know comes knocking, or if, uh, if there's a class action lawsuit uh, and a plaintiff's lawyer comes knocking. Um, and so that's you know that's you know, you know you work really hard to you know kind of build a, a life and knowing that that's kind of could be on the line. You know, that is a little daunting. That said, I'm I'm not, you know, it it never deterred me for the fact that for the reason that I've always and I think it's key for any trustee is to surround themselves with really, really good people. And if you get a really, you know, really good financial advisors and you get really, you know, build a team of really, you know, really good lawyers that have that know what they're doing and have been, you know, immersed in this industry. Those it, it any of that risk is greatly mitigated, in my opinion, because these folks have been around the block. Mm-hmm. If you ask me, you know, I, I don't think any, you know, you just, for example, a valuation firm. If you've never done an ESOP valuation, you know, I don't you're not going to be my first choice. You're not going to be <laughs> on my list at all for that matter. For right. Yeah, for real. Yeah. You know, and and so you really have to kind of, you know, be aware of of the folks that you're, you know, you're utilizing. I, you know, I vet every single valuation firm. I, I vet, vet all the lawyers, you know, I, you know, the department of labor requires that I do that. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's an obligation on my part to make sure I'm getting a good team that knows what they're doing. And it's going to make the transaction not only go smooth, but to, to, to do it correctly and to check all the boxes and make sure that it comports with everything the department of labor requires of us. Right. And so knowing that, it does, you know, knowing that I surround myself with good people, I sleep well at night. That's good. And I think I think the point of that and part of it's for education for people to know. I mean, the fiduciary, the, the trustee is personally liable and that can be pretty scary. I don't know if I told you, I actually am a trustee for an ESOP I did a long time ago. And it's a friend of mine. And I'm like, you know, but when I did it, I. I told my wife and we put all the money in her account. Right. I mean, it was just like this. <laughs> I was like, I was scared. I was like, I was like, Oh my gosh, you know, they, you could get sued personally for all of this. And, um, that, that should wake people up. And I think part of that topic is segueing into the other side of it. It's like, because of that, right. I think that part of it, I think as a trustee, and this is part of a question too, is helping people understand the the on the transaction side the role that you play it's a big deal like it's it's not like hey you want to be adversarial which i don't find you ever to be adversarial but you don't want to be creating roadblocks so the esop deal can't get done there there are just things you got to do because you are personally liable like and so Correct. you know so c- talk through that a little bit from your standpoint the question is more about the tra- on the transaction side what i know you have a team of people that kind of support you um, but how do you feel like okay with the liability that you're having from a personal liability standpoint? 
Sure. You know, I, and, and it's, I think it's twofold. It's not only surrounding yourself with good people, but it's also doing the right, you know, taking the right steps yourself personally as the trustee. It's jumping through the hoops. It's going and interviewing the, you know, the, the, the potential financial advisors and, you know, going and getting recommendation, you know, they, I often get recommendations of who, who I should talk to and, and talking to those people. And it's during the process, it's not only that, but it's also, you know, documenting the steps and documenting the rationale along the way as to what, you know, why we are doing what we're doing. Why do we just, how can we justify whether it's the price? How can we justify, you know, maybe it's, you know, the, the amount of SARS that are, are being uh, given to executives. Every deal is a little different. Um, these aren't cookie cutter. And so it's not in the sense that every, you know, you can just go along and, you know, it's the same, the, the same terms every, every time. So you have to be very, you know, selective. I, uh, you know, if it's, if the ESOP involves, for example, a, a really unique niche industry, you know, I would want a team that to the extent they have, you know, expertise in that, that's helpful because there are some very strange companies and I'd say strange in the, in the unique companies, whether it's on a consulting side or otherwise. Uh, a good example is I, I just closed a deal involving, involving a, a consultant in the charter school uh, systems. And that's, you don't cross paths with those very often. I and know, so, I haven't done one. Yeah. Um, you know, surprisingly or fortunately, I was able to find a lawyer that had, you know, had been on a board of a charter school and had not intimate knowledge of charter schools hmm. and a valuation firm that had, you know, surprisingly, you know, touched, you know, been in that, you know, on the, on the fringes of that industry as well. So I, you know, I think it's very important if, if you can, if it's possible, industry experience helps a lot in, in that, you know, in that process and in helping to, you know, garner and, and guide that transaction along the way with expertise. Yeah. What, what would be some things that you would be like, um, this is a tough question, but like when you look at the opportunity to become a trustee on something where you'd be like, I don't think I want that, you know, would it, would it be an area where you feel like you just don't have any industry experience and you can't get that or where would you just kind of turn down the opportunity? Sure. I, you know, I don't think it's ever an industry experience mm -hmm. issue. I mean, it, I think, it, you know, most trustees, you, you know, if, if you're, you can learn an industry, you know, litigators do that, you know, lawyers do that all the time, you know, particularly litigators. If you, you know, and one day you may uh, litigate an ERISA matter, the next day you may litigate an environmental matter. And you're always learning new industries and new facts. So I don't think it's, you know, being an ESOP trustee, I don't, I don't think I would turn one down just because I'd never done a charter school or I've never, I'd never done a pool company, for example, or whatever it is, you know, I would turn them down if I, I think I saw, you know, something that just doesn't sit right with me in my gut or I, you know, or you find out, you, you, you know, sometimes you meet somebody or you're like, oh, I don't think that's a great fit for me because I, I think personality really matters a lot too, because it's, re it's a relationship True. on a going basis. And if you don't hit it off with the person or the, the potential owner, you're going to be working with these people, you know, long, long down the road. So if, if you're, if you see a, a personality conflict, uh, that may be a good reason to, you know, maybe not take the, take the engagement. Mm -hmm. If, you know, sometimes maybe, you know, God forbid there'd be, a, you know, they've been in trouble in the past or this company is, you know, True. been cited or something or, you know, by the Justice Department. So you just never know. Yeah. And so, you know, you, you kind of got to do a little little due diligence, you know, in your own right behind the scenes before I and I always do before I accept an engagement just to make sure that it's a good it's a, a good fit for me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm going to be comfortable working with these these folks on a long term basis. Yeah, no, I think that makes a lot of sense. I think sometimes um, there are some broad strokes. Hey, we, I'm comfortable with this, but I'm not comfortable with that. So you're pretty much comfortable with most things. And when you're choosing f to be a trustee, is there any other concerns that you have up front, like geography or, you know, or is it, cause I've had other trustees tell me, Hey, I'm, I'm not going to go outside this proximate range of area that I'm, that I'm at because of the, you know, the difficult, we just talked about the, you know, the, the travel that they it can take. I mean, it's a, it takes a toll on you and your family as well. Well, you know, I, it absolutely does. I, I am certainly not, re, I don't restrict my practice to, to geography as, as you know, you and I have a, went on out on the West Coast, for That's example. Right. And That's so, right. well, you know, I'm bi coastal in, in the ESOPs that I'm currently a trustee over. I have them in the South, I have a lot of Florida, I have them in the South, I have them in Chicago, I have them on the, on the West Coast. But you're absolutely right. There is, there is a lot of travel in, because almost in every ESOP transaction, 
you know, there is a, a due diligence meeting on site. Um, and I always make it a practice, you know, COVID notwithstanding, that was a you know, a unique situation, but you know, I, I want to go, I want to go see the facility. I want to, you know, see the owners, look them in their whites of their eyes and kick the tires on it and make sure that, you know, this, this business that I am potentially buying on, you know, or buying on behalf of the plan participants, you know, it, it exists and it, you know, it looks robust and, you know, that it's there and mm-hmm. that, you know, so you could, you know, they say a picture is worth a thousand words. And I think a due diligence visit is also worth it, you know, is, is just as important. Yeah, it's really important. And part of it, too, as you said, the due diligence in getting to know and building a relationship, because you do have this ongoing um, process of being part of the company. Um, so those are some things I want to ask about. But before we go there, I wanted to kind of look at things. When you look at the trustee, like, I mean, if you compared yourself to different t- trustee practices, right? And there are a lot of different types of practices. The weird thing about trustees in the country, there's there's a hand, there's not a handful, but there's a there's a small group. It's not like you have a trustee in every single state. They're just that doesn't happen. But when you compare yourselves to, I, I guess, the pros and cons of saying because you're a smaller shop, you're, you know, and somebody's looking for, for what you do versus a bigger shop, like how would you compare yourselves and then kind of give somebody like a pro and con on, you know, what would be a good, a good fit for you as far as them making a decision for something like what you're providing as a trustee? Sure. I, I, I think every ESOP, you know, there's, there's a, there's a right fit for every ESOP and I'd be lying if I didn't say I'm the right fit for every ESOP. I, you know, I, I don't think, you know, there's, for any number of reasons, you know, I think you have to, you know, there's got to be the right, the right fit. Um, I think, you know, for those, you know, I think the benefits of a, a individual trustee, uh, such as myself is I, I think you have, I, a, I think there's some cost benefits to it. I, I dare say I don't probably charge as much as an institutional trustee, uh, because, you know, trust companies are, are large and they've got big payroll. And <laughs> at the end of the day, that's true. I don't, I, I can, I can afford to charge less. Uh, I think an individual trustee has the ability to be more nimble, uh, potentially more responsive and, and can turn a deal quicker, frankly. Mm-hmm. Um, oftentimes trust companies, if, if there's major decisions that need to be made, they have to run it through a committee of three people or, or however many else, uh, you know, depending on who you're dealing with. There's, I have no committee here. I'm in, you know, any decision is made by me and me only and I can make it pretty quickly. So I think responsiveness, you know, and uh, the ability to turn on a on a dime, as I like to say, mm-hmm. are really some of the advantages of a of an individual trustee. You know, on the downside, you know, if you know, sometimes in smaller shops, there's sometimes concern about you know longevity, if you will, and are you going to be around in five years? Are you going to be around in ten years? And you know, for and I, and I that's a that's a legitimate concern by by owners and those looking to explore it. You know, I'm pretty young still, and so I I think a lot of it's an interesting area because I think a lot of the trustees are, you know, this is, you know, becoming a more mature industry now. That's true. And I think some of the the folks that were kind of originally in the industry are, you know, it's from the eighties or, you know, it's, it's, are starting to, there's a graying of kind of, I think our trustees in this industry a little bit. So I think it's, I think it's right for some young blood, frankly. I (laughs) I I agree. I agree. (laughs) You know, experience and, and everything else, keeping all that in mind. I think one of the things you said earlier was helpful because you're building a team around you with tons of experience right. when you, you know, you're not like, you're not completely making a decision on your own. You're absolutely doing the opposite. You're collectively collaborating with people that have, have like, I know the one, you know, firm that we see a lot of, they have like 250 transactions on their belt. Like, it's like, that's not, you're not taking any chances there. So I think that does provide um, a very good solution. When, if somebody were to like, look at like they're listening and they're thinking, I might want to be an ESOP you know, at some point, or I'm thinking about it, you know, soon. Um, how would you explain from just a pure department of labor requ- requirement on the transaction itself? Like, as we talk about, you know, the department of labor, how would you sell, tell that comp, that company, Hey, this is what's going on. Why the transaction is the way it is. And then we'll talk about the transaction a little bit. Sure. Um, you know, if I were getting advice to a potential owner, it's, you know, th- this, the, because it is, these deals are scrutinized by the Department of Labor and they're, you know, it's under their purview, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a slightly different, you know, ESOPs are a different animal is how I would describe it from whether it's a private equity deal or really any other, you know, if, you know, any other transaction, if it were, for example, a, a strategic sale to another, another business in your industry, it's different. And 
for that reason, you know, we there's a lot more scrutiny. I think there's a, there's a lot more process that maybe that needs to be involved um, naturally. And I, you know, I, I see a lot of owners, you know, sometimes, you know, as part of the negotiation, you know, obviously we're, there's a, a letter of intent that, you know, is passed back and forth and it gets passed back a lot in most cases. And, you know, sometimes I think owners are like, why is this, why, why can't we get this done? Let's just, let's just knock this out. And, you know, I think owners really have to understand that, that you have to follow the process and you have to trust the process mm-hmm. um, because it's not like a, a private equity deal in that sense. And so, you know, and, and with that, you know, I, I think it's, you know, in part, you, you know, there, you have to, you know, press the process, you know, and, and be a little patient with it at the same time. To your point, you know, these deals, you know, as you, as you know, it's, they're mutually beneficial for everyone. They're beneficial for the owners as an exit strategy. They're very beneficial for the plan participants. It's, you know, it is a, an employee benefit that for all intents and purposes, they get for free that they don't have to pay for. And so it's, it is very beneficial to them as well. And so that's kind of the, you know, if you go in with that mindset, I, I think it, you know, that the transactions, you know, go a lot smoother and, you know, and, and, you know, usually close, a, you know, in a very effective fashion. Yeah. And I think part, part of what you said too, is just helping people know, like there is a requirement for an arm's length negotiation that the Department yes. of Labor doesn't mess with. They want to know the problems that have happened in the ESOP, the ESOP world years and years ago, which are part, part of our job is to kind of like flatten out some of the misconceptions when it comes to it really originated because there was, there's, there was originally not an arm's length transaction. There was one group of people was were putting together a whole transaction and they unfortunately, you know, conflict of interest, they just didn't look at it and boom, you have an overvaluation that creates an unsustainable ESOP and then who loses the employees. And, and ultimately I think to this, the intent for the selling shareholders and all those things, but those, those have gone away since these process agreements that you are referencing. And that kind of has necessitated a little bit of this formality and I, I guess a lot of the formality in a sense, but at the same time, you know, the nice thing about ESOP transaction negotiation is that there is a, it's not like you're someone like Tri- Bryce is looking to get you like, oh, I found something where I'm going to get you for a buck or 10 bucks or a million dollars, whatever. They're just doing a deal where they feel like is, is representative of, of what's truly fair market value. Exactly. And that's, that's the benchmark we have to hit. I mean, uh, fair, you know, no less than fair market value is the, is the definition. And so, you know, we're obligated to do that. Yeah, absolutely. When you look at like a company that says, oh, I want to do this, but I'm a little leery. Um, the Department of Labor really scares me. How would you, how would you calm that person down when it comes down to, um, I'm afraid the Department of Labor is going to be monkeying up my business, or I'm afraid that, you know, the trustee is going to be monkeying up my business or I've got, you know, it's going to be just not, it's going to be too much trouble, more trouble than it's worth. How would you kind of address that for a company that's thinking about that as an issue? Sure. I would argue that the benefits outweigh any burdens uh, associated, whether it's with the Department of Labor or certainly not with the trustee. You know, <laughs> if, if, you know, the, I guess really it's a twofold question, you know, you know, concerns about the Department of Labor, you know, I, I would be lying if I'd say that they aren't, you know, real in the sense that, you know, the Department of Labor does go out and they look at some of these transactions. So that is a, you know, a potential, you know, inevitable thing that might or might not happen. You just never know. Um, but you shouldn't be scared of it because if you do this process correctly uh, and you do, you know, and, and we all follow the steps we're supposed to follow, then you don't have anything to worry about. You've got a clean, you know, you have a clean deal with, you know, where, you know, the, all of the information was well vetted. All of the, the steps were taken. All of the processes were fo- followed. The due diligence was, you know, incredibly complete and the documents and, you know, everything, you know, evidence is that. So you shouldn't worry about it. You know, mm-hmm. could it happen? Yeah. Should you worry? You know, any, could, hell, anything's possible. But, you know, should you should you lose sleep over it? Absolutely not. Because, you know, I, I you know, with the deals that I do, I'm, you know, I, I know the process that, I'm, you know, I'm, if I if I can sleep at night, then you as an owner should sleep at night is the way I look at it. Yeah. And I think that that's good advice. And I think that partly to I think part of what we've tried to help people do is find the right people to work with when you get down to it. Mm-hmm. Um, if people, the right people to work with will guide you through a transaction where you can sleep at night because, and I think part of this interview is to help you understand if your trustee's not talking about the department of labor process agreement, then 
something's not something's not right because that's going to be a standard protocol of every good deal because that protects them and ultimately that protects the the selling shareholders and the employees as well from the department of labor issues that could come um you know everybody's going to genuinely i think if they're with an advisor that's just trying to do a good deal provide the right information i think the issue could be if if a client or a shareholder was trying to provide information that wasn't genuine or authentic or even fraudulent, right? That could per- create an issue. And I, I think, how would you touch on that issue? Like, I mean, I, I mean, I, it's kind of an obvious question, but I'm just curious what your thoughts are. Yeah. I mean, you, you want, you know, you, everybody needs to tell the truth at the end of the day. <laughs> tell and, the truth, the whole truth, and, nothing but the truth. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's, that's kind of part of it as an easy, you know, if, if you're an owner, you know, you've, we've got to tell the truth. You've got to give realistic projections. You know, your business, you know, might, you know, the, the valuation team that I hire, part of their job is, you know, to go and, and to your point, kick the tires and make, you know, do some testing to make sure that the, the projections are realistic. That said, it's not an audit. And, and so if, if, you know, if you're cooking your books or, or, you know, being un, you know, not forthright with information, you know, then that's a problem. And now that, that said, that's, you know, as part of any transaction, there's indemnities and warranties and representations that the owner makes, you know, to try to alleviate those things. And, you know, and, and so you will be subject to them. And that's, you know, that's part of the, the negotiation product, pro- yeah. the negotiation process is to, you know, try to ferret out some of that stuff as much as humanly possible. But, you know, it's, you know, you again, you hope, you know, you hope in, in 90, every case, every ESOP I've been involved with, they've been really great owners, really honest owners, really smart owners, uh, and folks that really want to do the ESOP for the right reasons. Mm-hmm. And so I've, I've never come across that to date. Yeah. And I think so. that, I mean, and that makes sense because I think that's probably majority of, of, how ESOPs are and but it's those it's those outliers that get talked about like what happened with that one right and I think part of it is as the um, as you're listening to this it's thinking about who your advisors are and what advice they're giving you and I would say one of the f- red flags I see in our industry is if you're doing it for the wrong reasons you know wrong reasons might be hey I just don't want to pay any taxes like I, that's right. probably not a good reason to do ESOP Wrong reasons right. might be, hey, you know, I'm, I'm going to get a much better va- valuation here than something else. And it, it's not that like you can't or can. It's just that needs to be a that needs to be coupled with other reasons that make it make sense. So one of the questions I, I, I ask people, and I think you do, too, is why are you doing an ESOP? Like, I think that helps to answer and vet out that idea. Like, what? why are we even here? Right. And I think most of the time people genuinely do want to do the right thing by their employees. You know, when you get down to I agree. It. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. So so as you as you go into um, the providing the service you do on the transaction side, which we covered a good a good bit kind of back and forth with your team and all that, you as you segue into the ongoing, because we do like have a separate like engagement for you. Like you're coming in now, the deal's closed, you're the trustee. So the first things are just what sort of roles, what are your responsibilities as ongoing trustee? To the ESOP trust, which of course is benef- is is really representing the beneficial owners or the participants. Sure, you know it's. It, it, I always say it's a very unique. Uh, again, ESOPs are a strange uh, animal in the sense that the trustee is hired to negotiate a deal. Again, you know, a, against the owner. Yet, as soon as the deal's done, he puts on a different hat and he almost acts as a, as a more of a consultant kind of role or a, uh, you know, an advisory role in large measure and working with the owner, you know, to ensure that, you know, everything goes smoothly, uh, you know, for purposes of the ESOP plan and the trust and, you know, that the the contributions are made, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, on an ongoing basis, you know, I think there's a, you know, a, one of the misconceptions of ESOPs, I think by many people is like, oh, this trustee is going to come in and, you know, take over my business. It's, you know, he's like an activist investor. He's going to start second guessing me all the time. He's going to start controlling the day-to-day operations. And that's the last thing that, you know, anybody, it's, it's farthest from the truth, frankly. You know, my job, I'm, I'm generally at what's called a directed trustee, which means oftentimes there is a, a an ESOP committee above me that is usually comprised of some of the board members and usually the, you know, an outside 
director often chairs it and they give me direction as to, you know, certain aspects of, of the ESOP and how, you know, how to do things that, you know, pursuant to the ESOP. My job as a trustee is, is fairly limited, frankly. It's, you know, I hire the board uh, on an annual basis. You know, I, I control the plan assets to the extent there are any, <laughs> you know, you know, when they do, you know, when a, they start to accumulate, whether that's, you know, monetarily through investments or otherwise. Uh, oftentimes you'll hire, you know, a, a, an outside investor to, to do those roles um, and generally a, a duty to monitor and, you know, make sure that what's going on comports with with uh, the rules of ERISA. That's kind of it. It's it's not, you know, the job of Bryce Lennox is not to go in and start second guessing, you know, why did you why did you do this? Why did you buy a truck? Why did you you know, why did you drop this client or the, the like? That's that's not my job. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, working, you know, on an outside basis and collaborating a lot with the owners. And, you know, you know, I, I think there's this perception this trustee is this, you know, evil empire outside of the outside of the business that is, you know, just there to point fingers and, and be a naysayer. And that's really I think that's not the truth. I, you know, it's as much anything as a, it's a, a very fluid relationship with with the owner of the business and with the board in large measure. Um, because at the end of the day, we all have fiduciary duties to to the plan participants and to the company. And so, you know, we all, you know, it, it's sometimes, it takes a village sometimes to to make sure that those fiduciary duties are are met and, and, you know, there's compliance in those things. So it's not as adversarial as I think many people perceive it to be potentially. Yeah. I mean, even even the other side of it, it's it's an a advisory situation where, hey, we have a question about this, this, that could affect our repurchase liability. And how could you, yeah. you know, help us walk through that? Or we have a question about even considering, I, I think a question I get a lot from companies that do partials is what happens if we want to sell the company, you know, and how, and how does the trustee interact with that as far as the board of directors making that decision? And then, so, you know, in general, right, what, what's your role there when you get down to like, if they're going to sell, and the company's just going to go ahead and, and sell out to a strategic after the ESOP is done. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, I, I you know, did, to your point, you know, thirty percent, hundred percent, it, it kind of varies a little bit. Sure. But you know, it's at that point, you, you know, my role as a trustee switches a little bit, and it's to once again still fiduciary, but it's to you know ensure that whatever transaction is is again, it's a fair deal to the to the plan participants. And often the times, you know, that will once again you'll engage. You know, a team of folks to kind of do the, do a very similar process to make sure that, you know, that it is a good deal and that, you know, that it is in the best interests of the plan participants. And this isn't just a, you know, a, a, whether it's I'll call it a sham transaction or a money grab or something like that or an easy exit, you, you know, it's mm-hmm. that is, is truly a, a good thing for, you know, going forward. And so that's kind of my role in that point, uh, you know, is to, is again, you know, it, always looking out for the interests of the shareholders, but you know I do have a I do have a role in in any transaction. They did uh, you know an owner can't just go and not tell me and you know sell the company and hey well, hey by the way Bryce uh, right. sold it yesterday. I you know. know you got you got you got new folks to deal with. So C- congrats, you know, right? It's, yeah, you know, yeah, you're going to have some influence over that if it is a partial. Yeah. And so I I think the the direct question I get from people if I have if I'm the owner and I have 51 percent and you're the trustee and you have 49 percent and I'm on the board. The board says, "Hey, we want to. We've accepted this LOI." Um, obviously, you're an owner. Like the trust is an owner. I mean, you're representing the trust. How would that work? Like, what would you how, walk that out for? Like, the next steps would be, "Hey, we're going to have to go ahead and, um, you know, look at the offer from the trustee side and make sure that we approve of the deal." What would you do specifically in that regard? Um. You know, probably a lot of the same things that we we talked about, you know, kind of, you know, look to your financial advisor, look to my counsel to kind of, you know, kick the tires and make sure it it is, you know, exactly kind of the way it should be. And uh, again, I I lean I'll lean heavily on my outside folks for that to Mm -hmm. to for guidance to make sure that it is indeed, you know, what you know, what it's cracked up to be and what they uh, perceive it to be and. And so it, I don't know that it changes that much. Frankly. Yeah, I think the main the main part of my question probably is just if I was fifty one percent, I could pretty much vote to sell the company, right? Even though, because I have I have control versus right. not control. So if you and I would never, I would. This is all hypothetical, but it's just curious because I think this is part of something people ask me all the time. I get asked all these kind of questions. <laughs> you know, you'd imagine like I get asked a million different ones, but would it be a 
it wouldn't be possible in that situation if they really wanted to sell for the for the trustee to say, hey, can't do that, right? Even though they might voice their objection if it's not a good deal for the company. I think so, but I think there's certainly remedies if, <laughs> you know, even if you are the, the minority ease up trustee, I mean, again, you know, an owner's got, you know, they've, they've got, they got fiduciary duties, you know, to not, this isn't, can't be just self-enriching at the right. end of the day. That's true. It's not a so, rubber stamp. You know, hey, all right, well, let's go ahead and do that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Got you it. know, they, they, you know, in most companies, if it's a closely held company or a small company, you have, they have, you know, even maybe higher duties to, to minority shareholders. So true. it's not a situation where somebody just be like, it's my way or the highway. And, yeah. you know, frankly, I'd be a little disappointed if, if I were working with an owner that oh, took I, that at it. I, 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 may have picked the, I may have picked the wrong horse. No, for and sure. That and, and that's part, I mean, I was kind of rabbit holing it a little bit, but I was kind of like, you know, from an extreme standpoint, I think people think about this right. stuff and they're like, what happens if, because because a lot of people don't know, you know, and part of it's interviewing the trustee, understand the relationship, understanding the impact of, of what this means. I don't think that they want to put themselves in a corner. I don't see it an issue with if it's a good deal, why, why would trustee ever not, you know, accept it? And, and I would say typically a good deal is it's probably something above fair market value is, yeah. is what you're getting offered. You know, why else would you want to sell it? You know, when you get down to it. So it usually is, is everything's usually in alignment. I mean, that owner and the controlling owners, right, would be in alignment. Um, yeah, yeah I, I've never. I would be shocked if, to your point, if it's it's a, a solid offer, well above or above fair market value, not even well above. If it's a good deal, then everybody will likely be on the same page. Mm -hmm. If it's below fair market value and they're still pushing forward, then you know that's a different scenario, and that's one yeah. you know where yeah, you have to <laughs> scratch your head. Why are you where, doing this? Right? There's something here. Yeah, that's exactly. Not, and yeah. I, you know, I think the more questions would be asked, a lot more questions would have to be asked. Right. So, and like you said, one of the things about that is there isn't just the trustee. There's an independent valuation firm that's reviewing everything from an independent level, and they're digging into the the even though the deal's done, they're digging into the 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 all the details of everything that's happening in the company on an annual basis. So you're getting that support right. as well. Um, well, great. So I think the last kind of final question is just more about just, you know, from a ESOP versus uh, another type of deal. You know, if somebody's thinking, you know, I'm going to sell my company to a strategic or a private equity or a third party versus an ESOP, um, what would you say to them in terms of how to guide them towards what what's the right decision for them at the end of the day? You know, I, I think it, it largely depends on a lot, kind of what we talk about. What are your motivations? Mm -hmm. If you're motivated by taking every last dollar out of a, a deal and sailing off into the sunset, you know, and, and parking and drinking margaritas on the beach and wiping your hands clean of a business, then an ESOP's not right for you mm -hmm. at the end of the day. Sure. If if you're if that's your motivation, if you are motivated uh, in a different fashion, if you're motivated, you know, to help benefit your employees to still, you know, what I would call maybe make it a, a, a smooth transition out of the business, um, you know, I, then I think an ESOP is a really good opportunity for you. You know, there's there's a lot of, I think, industries and certain businesses that are custom built for ESOPs. I really do. Companies that, you know, may not be, don't have strategic buyers or their the, the, their competitors, for example, um, you know, are conflicted out, you know, manufacturers reps are a really good example of, of those that are really good ESOP companies. Um, you know, but it, it's, and so as a, as a result, you know, I think it's motivation. I think it's, you know, kind of what your, where, where your head is, you know, if again, is there, what are you driven by mm -hmm. and what's your outcome and where, where do you see this and, and why are you doing what you're doing, uh, large, in large measure, like we discussed earlier. Mm -hmm. I think that's the difference. If, if you want to go scrape cash, you know, go to, you know, there's, there's plenty of ways to, to go and, and maximize value. Mm -hmm. If you're looking at it from a, a different lens, then an ESOP is a wonderful opportunity for an owner to, to not only exit, um, but also do it in a, a, in a way that's really, really great. And to preserve the business that he's worked, he or she's worked very hard to build over a long time and keep company culture. You know, oftentimes you hear these business owners and ESOPs, you know, time and time again, it's like, this is my family. I'm not deserting my family. I want to take care of my family. And when you hear that, you know, you know, that resonates and you know that you're, you're with a, a you're, they're doing it for the right reason. And this is not the kind of person 90% of the time, you know, that is looking to just, 
you know, take as much cash out of the, and, and sit on, sit on the beach somewhere. So, yeah, you know, I, I think that's the difference. I, I hear that. I think that's a good theme of, of things where people do talk a little bit about their employees a lot and those initial conversations that we have with them. And you kind of, kind of like starts to align well with what we want as a client too. I mean, we're, we're wanting to work with people that are really going to be good long-term ESOP companies, not, Hey, we're doing this for some weird short-term reasons that, for me, like I want, I want them to win, but I want their employees to win. And really I want the trustee and the valuation firms. I want everybody to win. So, so part of when we put a deal together, we, we were looking at all those things. Cause if that happens, then everybody that kind of comes out of that, it's like, that was a good experience. Like, let's talk about like how, how that was fun. And we will tell everybody that, you know, this is the best thing ever. Right. As opposed to, yeah. oh my gosh, we shouldn't have done this. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, that's I, I you know you've done you know you've got a, a really solid deal when you start getting referrals from those people whether it's in the same industry or you know friends of theirs and and yeah. it, it you know you you know you've you've hit pay dirt and you've done it you've done it right you've done when it you right. start getting things. and you, you could feel good about what you're doing for a living when you get down to it, like I think part of the like I know that you do this but like the reason you probably gravitated to ESOP is because you probably really enjoy it and it's like you're helping people I love it. yeah. It is, it is very different than litigation. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it is very different litigation. No, that's cool. And, and I'm happy that you got out of the litigation side. I would imagine that's hard. That's a hard, stressful career, you know. Yes, it, 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 it's wearing. And it yeah. wears on you. Um, but I, like I said, this is uh, I'm, I love getting up every day uh, and, and working in this community and working with folks like you. Um, because there's a real, a ton of really talented, talented, smart people that are very passionate about ESOPs yeah. in, in, in the community that we work in. And, uh, that, that, you know, it's, it's a great, that's cool. Well, Bryce, thanks for, for your time today. I appreciate all the information and the insight for everybody that, that was able to listen today. My pleasure. It's great to be on. So with that, for everybody else, thank you for listening and we will see you on our next step on this journey. 